Hi gang, Rob here. It is the afternoon of 13 May 2020. You're not going to believe what I got in the mail a couple weeks ago. A big old medium flat rate box from Melbourne, Florida from our old and dear friend as well as prolific knife researcher and historian Steve from Florida. How about the truth? Yes. After, I think, about three years, we finally have another installment in our traditional knives anthology. We're going to do it just like we always do. I'm going to try to hold up knives and show you what the heck Steve is talking about as I read through his voluminous notes about some of the most significant, beautiful, and historic traditional pocket knives ever made and today we've got five of them for you I'm breaking this batch into two parts because he took a lot of notes and it's going to take a while to get through them so I think it's about time to get rolling shall we first I will read you Steve's introduction nothing in front of the camera except my ugly hands Steve says Hey Rob, and hello everyone. It's been a long time. Well over three years since our last one. So I've decided to do an extravaganza. Knives from a few makers, vintage brief history lessons, general lessons, several patterns GEC has run only once, but should run again. And in a tribute to our late friend Derek Bone, hmm, that's going to come in the next TKA video something for everyone and i hope you enjoy it we've got a lot to cover so let's get started yes let's first up great eastern cutlery northfield unexcelled premium pen and pocket knives we have <laughs> a number 73 liner lock in genuine stag i will uh, let you guys read the tube label if you'd like you can pause to do that the important stuff is down here at the bottom number seven three five one zero eight l in genuine stag serial number w seven yeah made in 2008 12 years ago here we go mm-hmm Steve says, first up is Simply Eye Candy and the very first run of Liner Locks GEC ever made. It's the 735108L in Genuine Stag. I have several of these from different years, he says, but this is my personal favorite. My neighbor called it Coco Blonde. Why would we say that? Hmm. <clears throat> Coco Blonde number seven. And the name stuck. Check out how the blonde stag on the front cover hafted out as smooth as marble. Both covers are perfectly matched. In profile, he means. And now's a good time to discuss the guidelines for stag production folders. The color and even the bark need not be the same. However, the profile from cover to cover should match in order to be deemed perfectly matched. The genuine stag designation means Bill Howard bought select whole antlers and slabbed it himself to get better form-fitted handles. These are not torched at all, of course. Mac Latham, a collector knives, stated that genuine stag and natural stag knives no longer being are no longer being made by GEC because it has been become far too difficult to source especially the larger production runs they're making today buy these older knives if you can many of these older knives are fetching incredibly high prices on the secondary market GEC only made 23 of these in genuine stag and get a load of that serial number 007 James freaking 
bond. And let's check out the knife. It is a drop point with a long cut swedge and a nail neck. The unexcelled etch. Pull weight on this one, guys. A seven and a half, maybe an eight. And then you see the liner lock, which actually comes up over the top of the tang. And it takes a pretty stout thumb to break that one loose. You can see it's beautifully centered, and look at the hafting. Coco Blonde number seven. What a beauty. <clears throat> okay, now let's shift gears, says Steve, and go back to 1987, where there was another man we all owe a great debt of gratitude. Charlie Dorton. Hmm, check this out. Charlie founded the Bulldog brand knife company. These knives were all made in the Olberts factory in Zollingen, Germany, with the exception of a few being made by GEC. But more importantly, Charlie was directly responsible for bringing his idea of the long lost patterns back to life via the black box Winchester program. He worked out a deal with the Olin Corporation who owned all the original tooling and dies that were used to produce the Winchester knives from the early 1900s. Nearing the year 1987, Charlie's attention was drawn to the talents of a young Bill Howard. <clears throat> Due to the original Winchester knives being made in the USA, Charlie felt that the authorized reproductions should be made on American soil as well. This was quite an ambitious program because many of these knife patterns had not been made in perhaps 50 plus years. And like other cutlery companies that remained, Queen was only producing a core line of knives. However, they were of good quality and they were the only company left making them in the old way. Bill Howard had the skill and ambition, but he had never made some of these older patterns and to complicate matters, all of the master cutlers who did know how to make them had retired from Queen and some had passed away. There are tricks to making certain patterns, and Bill had to learn through trial and error. Imagine how much that cost. This number 2921 Coffin Jack <laughs> is one of those earlier patterns made in the first year of the program, 1987. Oddly enough, the official name is known as a gunstock jack. Okay. But somewhere along the way, everyone started calling it a coffin. This program did make a smaller three inch version that is the normal gunstock shape. Along with several other patterns, this three and a half inch coffin jack is the most sought after. Note the lack of sharpening choils, Steve says. This is how they were made back then. Such a retro cool knife with knurled bolsters. Uh -huh. Dig those tiny hand hammered rivets. and the heraldic shield. But the antique original dark brown, we know it looks black, but it's dark brown, Roger's bone handles are the most special element of this knife. Look at that stuff. Oh. Charlie had gotten a tip that the old closed down Utica factory still had a treasure trove of these bone handles for sale. He and his, bi his business partner in bluegrass cutlery made the drive and discovered barrels full of this Rogers bone already dyed, slabbed, and jigged up in a loft. This Rogers bone 
is dated from 1910 to 1937, making the bone handles on this knife anywhere from 83 to 110 years old. All of this bone was used on only certain patterns and only from 87 to 90, 1987 to 1990. I believe it is easy to distinguish from the peach seed jig bone used on most patterns in the reissue program. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> They are fewer and farther between on eBay these days, but can still be bought for a song. All of the black box Winchesters are carbon steel. Let's take a sweet look. There is your pen blade. Look at the finishing. Beautiful. A nice stout seven, maybe seven and a half pull on that main blade. Absolutely beautiful walk and talk. Love the coffin end caps. Mm -hmm. Steve says, Google black box Winchesters slash blade forums to see the thread that shows every pattern. Prepare to be impressed. The red letter black box Winchesters along with the case classics that came soon after are responsible for the talent possessed today by Bill Howard because of what he had to learn to give new birth to these old patterns. The first time I saw a coffin jack, I thought it was the most ridiculous pattern ever made. It's not ergonomic in hand, but for some reason it really grows on you and absolutely it does. Uh, and I'm not alone in that assessment. Hmm, what a beauty. What a beauty indeed. Oh. You know, every time I do one of these traditional Knives Anthology videos, I always try to think of excuses as to why the knives didn't get back to Steve. Today's no exception. Okay, next up. We're moving forward in time, guys to a Great Eastern Cutlery Northfield Unexcelled brand of premium pen and pocket knives. This one's going to be the 892309 in genuine stag number 21. <clears throat> Here it is. Oh. Okay, back to Steve. Every once in a while, Bill Howard will produce a pattern that is a bold undertaking, or as Rob puts it, a statement knife. And the number 89, Executive Whitler, certainly is one of those knives. I can literally picture the folks at GEC pulling out their hair during the making of this knife. Understand this is no work knife, rather a gentleman's folder. A Sunday go to meeting knife. Longtime GEC dealer Frank Powers says whenever he goes out for a steak dinner, this is the knife he drops in his pocket. At four inches long closed, it is downsized from the original originals known as melon testers or sausage knives that were five and a half inches closed. The four inch frame is more pocket friendly. GEC's Whitler version equipped with the spear main is called the melon tester. All two blade half Whitler versions, regardless of blade type, are called the riverboat gambler. The genuine stag on this Whittler is form-fitting, yet rounded, like a pencil. Sweet, says Steve. Barry of Gunstock Jacks picked up this mint Whittler from a knife show long after they were produced and sold out. I bought it from him immediately, says Steve. Upon getting this jewel in my hand, I shot him an email to say that it had the best stag of the entire run. And believe me, Steve looked at them all. <laughs> to which Barry replied, shoot, that's the best stag, period. And I have yet to see any custom maker attempt to make this knife. 
dig those double lined and pinched bolsters. Yeah. I bet the crew at GEC is in no big hurry to run this one again. Bill Howard is such a badass. Check out the close tolerances and we'll see that as we close the knife. And look down its length. Look at how far the tip of that main Warncliffe blade extends between the tangs of the two secondaries. And note the taper on that center liner. Just a work of art. But wait, says Steve. This Whittler has a dirty little secret. Note how the six-digit number is split among the two secondaries. So there is 892. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Not only is it interesting that they split the model number, But there's an issue. You guys know your GEC numbering system. What should the third digit of this model number be if it has a Warncliffe main? It's supposed to be a zero. But it's marked two on the tang and on the tube. Two is GEC's number for a spear point. Steve says, release the hounds. I want a refund. Ha! Not. And then he gives a little editorial comment. When you're a badass, Bill Howard, you can get away with this once in a while. LOL. To my knowledge, no one has ever mentioned or even caught this blunder. I'm such a GEC fiend, says Steve. They even got it wrong in the production totals. Heck, I guess this pattern gave the whole factory fits. Only 22 were made with genuine stag. Well, that brings us to the next knife in today's lineup. This will be the model Steve referenced just a minute ago. The other 89 in today's collection. This is going to be the Riverboat Gambler, model number 891212, in Antique Pioneer Jig Bone, knife number three. Back to Steve. The Riverboat Gambler is no slouch either. Such a menacing clip point. Oh, oh, isn't it though? Wow. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Cam tangs and beautiful, beautiful. <clears throat> the Riverboat Gambler is no slouch the antique Pioneer Jig Bone on this titty really looks great on such a thin knife handle, and yes, it does. I don't know if the camera can capture the fine detail in this unique jigging. Well, let's see. If you notice, and I think it is picking this up, there's almost a rope pattern in the trough of each jig groove. You really see it on the pile side. Mm -hmm. And then Steve continues, just as the camera can't capture the incre incredible quality you can literally feel in either one of these two knives. And he is right. Uh, remember, guys, this is a 2012 knife. When GEC wasn't making a lot of cam tangs, And frankly, some of the ones they made after this time weren't great. This is beautiful. I mean, beautiful. And look at how those blades nestle. in that half, half Whittler pattern with no center liner. They just congress perfectly. Let's see if this one's ever rubbed. Nope. Note, note the huge drawn swedge on the main blade on the pile side. 
to give clearance. See this this full flat ground blade would have continued to thicken as it got to the top and would have maybe caused a rub, but that big, deep drawn swedge reduced that thickness and gave clearance. Pretty cool. Okay, moving right along. <clears throat> Knife number four in the lineup for this evening. It's a Northfield Unexcelled Premium Pocket Knife. This is the number 550113L. And there's a C. I don't remember what. Maybe Steve will explain it to us. I don't know. Look at that little beauty. The number 550113L. Hound's Tooth with Warncliffe. Here's a knife that GEC has only run once in 2013 and should run again. The Houndstooth with Warncliffe. Don't confuse this with the tiny number 18 they ran three years later. The Houndstooth dwarfs it at three and a half inches closed. This one has the autumn gold jigged bone, lined and pinched bolsters, and the machine swedge, or the cut swedge, as Bill likes to call it, found only on the Northfield versions. It also has the liner lock. And that is a stout liner lock as well. And that's a man's knife, guys. That's a solid eight pole. Did you hear that? It walks, it talks. <clears throat> Steve says, I have another exactly like it, but without the liner lock. Both are great little work knives, stout and ergonomic in hand. They nearly disappear in your pocket. As much as I love their liner locks, for some reason they made the release tab a little too tall, in my opinion. Oh, I don't know. For this knife only, it was taller. Let's take a look. Yeah. So there's the 73 we looked at earlier, and there's the 55. It is indeed taller. But both kind of match the height of the blade tang. But I don't know. But I've read about a few guys grinding the tab down, making it more handy in the draw cut position. Well, I guess you got a point there, Steve. I guess you do. I don't find it uncomfortable, though. It's kind of a nice index point. I don't know. I don't know why GEC didn't offer this with a clip point as an option. They are only offered as a spear as the alternative to the Warncliffe. This frame absolutely rocks with a clip point. We know this due to the fact that they made a two-blade jack version back in 2010. It was in a previous TKA video. Early last year, they ran it again, calling it the Bird Dog, but with only a spear main in single and two-blade jack versions. <clears throat> in my opinion, this frame works so much better with a warning or a clip point. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of another installment in our traditional knives anthology. I will line them up so you can get a loving gaze at them before I shut off the camera. Look at those beauties. Yeah. That is almost 30 years of Bill Howard right there. <clears throat> Going back to the Winchester. Pretty cool. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Stay tuned. In a couple days, we're going to have the other half of this batch from Steve. As usual... Our family continues to pray for all of you, for those affected in any negative way by things going on in this world right now. We pray for your health, for your financial solvency, for your spiritual wellness. That's it for now. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the word is sharp. <clears throat>